Um, Jane, go ahead and introduce introduce yourself. Uh, sure. Um, hi, everybody. Um, so my name's Jane, and as I said, I'm over in Clevedon near Bristol. I've been coaching um, for over 15 years now. I uh, discovered coaching when I was working at the BBC in a marketing role um, and was given the opportunity to uh, take part in a programme internally. Um, and around that time, I was spinning far too many plates and completely unaware that I was heading for burnout. Um, so I burned out um, quite soon after leaving my role and deciding I wanted to be a coach. Um, uh, I ended up taking on far too much all in one go and kind of was out the frying pan into the fire. Um, and at the stage when I burned out, I um, my the doctors at the time didn't identify it as such. And it was only through having um, been through a kind of lengthy recovery after six months of being sort of bed bound that I um, started hearing other people's burnout stories and it being called burnout and recognizing the similarities and really feeling that there was something I needed to do about starting a conversation around burnout and helping other people to identify it um, raising awareness of it um, and it became the, the kind of focus of my work and very much my passion and which is still very much my passion today um, fortunately the conversation has um, elevated and there's more people talking about burnout now than ever before but equally there's also more people um, burning out so it's 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 really rife and I'll, I'll talk about that as part of um, what we do this evening um, but uh, but now it's really about deepening the understanding of it, which is why this this workshop's come together today for all of you. Because I think as coaching as coaches, we have a, a powerful place that we can help uh, make an impact. And um, and burnout will be coming to your door if it hasn't already. Um, it will be um, for for sure um, because it's so rife. So I'm looking forward to sharing lots with you this evening. Hey, shall we get started then? Um, so I do have a presentation of, uh, I've got some slides to share with you because there's lots of concepts I'm going to be sharing with you and things that I think are quite helpful to have a visual of as well as just me talking. Um, but at the same time, I, I also want to strike a balance so it's not kind of death by PowerPoint as well. So, so I will um, screen share um, uh, to kick us off and to, to share with you a little bit more about about me, about why I'm talking about burnout, about what we're going to actually cover tonight. So you've got an idea of what's coming up. Um, as Alex alluded, um, we will also be um, incorporating some breakout rooms. We, we really intend for it to be an interactive workshop. So um, it is lovely when your cameras are on and we can feel like we're actually interacting with real people. Um, so do feel free to pop, pop them on, but equally it's really an adult learning space. So take care of your own needs too. And if you need to have your camera off because of other things going on, in the background for you in your life, then that's absolutely fine too. Um, so I'm just going to bring up PowerPoint for you. And um, this is, um, just make sure I've got the first. Okay, um, do you see the, just the slide that has a little die holding the battery or do you see everything? Just, just a slide, yeah. Okay, fabulous. Um, so this is essentially what I'm going to be covering this evening. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about what burnout actually is. Um, most people will have an idea, um, but I want to give you a kind of more of a definition of it. Um, and I will go into how you can spot it and the signs and symptoms and how it actually affects us. Um, because it, whilst the awareness of burnout has be, has risen, it now gets thrown around quite casually. And so I think it's helpful to actually be able to define what it is versus just feeling a bit tired at a weekend in a healthy way, for example. So, so I'll talk to that. Um, I'll talk to the fact that it's why it's important now and why um, these types of conversations are, are really crucial. And um, I'll talk about how you can spot the signs, the symptoms and what to do when those signs and symptoms um, are really signs and symptoms of concern where you wouldn't be able to stay ethically in a safe place as a coach and work within competencies with a client um, when you would really need to be, um, as a duty of care to your client, professionally signposting towards other support. Um, I'll talk about recovery and what that can look like and the various different lengths of time that that can take, the different ways in which people can recover and how they recover and what best supports recovery. Um, and then we'll talk about what tools 
um, you actually already have on board. I really want you all to come away from this evening feeling more confident um, and feeling well equipped already with what you already know as a coach and really how to lean into those competencies and um, and feel more certain and secure and sure about what to do next when you do encounter uh, a client who's burning out or maybe with clients you already have uh, as part of your practice that you've been wondering about. Um, and we will allow time as well for, for questions and answers. Um, and if at any time you have a burning question and you really want to um, just you know get it answered straight away, feel free just to unmute yourself and, and bring your voice into the room or use the chat. I'm not very good at talking and reading the chat, but Alex <laughs> is here by my side supporting me this evening. So he'll scoop up any questions that you might pop in there and he'll, in, he'll do the interrupting for you and help me to notice that there's maybe questions that would be relevant for me to address sort of in the moment versus saving them up for the end. Um, so um, I've told you a little bit about myself. Um, the, the reason that I'm here talking to you about burnout, aside from my own kind of experience of it, um, has been what I've gone on and done really since that experience that I had. So as I said, I became really passionate about raising the awareness and starting the conversation. I became very involved with, um, I was involved with the NHS as their resident life coach expert for, for many years. I also um, wrote for the Huffington Post and got brought in on various different um, television um, interviews that they did, um, appearing uh, on behalf of them in panel discussions at events. And that led um, to me uh, get, doing a lot really on radio and television. Anytime there's something to do with sleep, burnout, stress, um, I tend to get brought in as a, a bit of a spokesperson. So I, I deliver lots of talks and workshops and um, I, I love talking about this topic, which is why I'm here with all of you. Um, and I see coaching as being a huge part of the solution for the 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 global pandemic that we're currently in in relation to burnout because I think if toxic work cultures can shift towards coaching cultures then so much of what's currently a problem um, from the external side that people experience will start to alleviate and shift and change so I'm really passionate about equipping coaches so that they can um, get out there and continue doing the work that they do and grow their businesses and um, get more coaches into organizations so that we can really turn things around. Um, I'm accredited by the ICF, also the Association for Coaching and the National Council, of, um, sorry, the, the National, uh, the NICP, they just recently changed their acronym and it still throws me. The National Council of Psychotherapists is what it used to be called and it's National um, Integrated Council of Psychotherapists now. So um, they recognize that so many psychotherapists have so many different skills that they integrate and they came up with a new acronym. Um, I, um, after completing a postgraduate certificate in coaching, went on and did an advanced diploma in integrative art psychotherapy. Um, I just found in my coach training that the tools which enabled me to help people to connect to their bodies, so what's often referred to as somatic coaching, those tools were so phenomenally important and powerful in the conversations I was having with people burning out that I wanted more of that. I wanted to know how I could integrate more um, use, use of arts. So when we um, were talking about what was on our desk and we were talking about the, the painting that, that um, I think it was, I'm trying to remember now, Irina, was it Irina? I think had the lovely watercolors in front of her. Felicity. Felicity, sorry. Um, I, I, that's something that can be used in coaching and really bring coaching to life and help people make sense of what's going on for them metaphorically and then help them to become more aware at a bodily level of the the inner guidance that we get all the time the signs and symptoms that our body's out of alignment those things being there and um, so I started integrating all of those things in the work I do I started researching a lot um, on the topic of burnout and writing about burnout and talking about burnout and then I um, wrote my first book which was published in 2015 and I've got my second book coming out next year um, 
I became a tutor on a postgraduate program myself, which I still teach on. I'm also a coach supervisor. Um, I continue to contribute to Psychologies magazine as one of their resident coaches. Um, and as I mentioned, doing things um, in the media as, as well. Um, really all with the, the intention of, of making things more more de like demystifying and and encouraging more conversations around the topic. So before we get into um, anything that you might want to bring this evening, I want to talk about contracting because I feel that's really important. Um, Alex said, of course, that the call itself is being recorded um, so that others can benefit from this session who weren't able to be here tonight in person. Um, and as he said, you know, just bearing that in mind with anything you, you bring and, and your own level of comfort with self-disclosure, would really ask you to please be mindful around um, any clients you work with or organizations and bring the themes and the, the topics that you encounter at times when you want to share, but not their names so that you protect their confidentiality within this space, as well as protecting your own confidentiality in whatever way you need that to be there for your own psychological safety. And whatever anybody brings in the breakout rooms, which won't be recorded, please really hold that um, with that sense of um, it being a safe space that you're sharing in and you're not going to go you know, off down the pub and tell everybody about it or discuss it with your partner later. Or, you know, Hopefully all of that goes without saying, but I, I do want to speak to it just to make sure. Um, so burnout and what is burnout? Um, I said I would give you a, a sort of technical definition of it to help you differentiate from general tiredness. Um, general tiredness is, is something healthy. You know, when we've been doing something all day, we've been either energetically fulfilled through doing something that we love and maybe also physically we've been using our 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 physical strength or our mental capacities and we feel healthily tired at the end of the day we're able to go to bed um relax unwind we're able to switch off go to sleep sleep well wake up in the morning feeling fully refreshed that's a normal kind of tiredness and that's a a normal sense of of balance in ourselves but when we've been firing what's called the fight or flight response day in, day out, because we've been responding to situations um, in such a way that we're triggering their stress response, there's a cumulative buildup of that. And, and burnout is the collective result of lots of different factors that might mean that we've been in a situation of prolonged ongoing stress. And then quite often because that stress is going on and we're firing the stress response in the background and not for reasons that um, it's designed for. So not because, so for example, I've got a picture of a lion, you know, not because there's a real threat, there's a lion and we need to get away from it. That sort of fight the lion or flee from the lion. You'll have heard that, I'm sure. Um, but because there's maybe more like a deadline that we've got facing us or um, somebody has put us on the spot with something and we don't feel like we're competent or we're not prepared and you know we fire this response in ourselves when we're running basically on adrenaline all the time the effect of that leads to the severe depletion of the adrenal glands and then also of our immune system um, and the constant triggering of um, the stress response can really damage various organ systems within the body um, so there were, there's lots of signs and symptoms of burnout that I will speak to. And essentially these all stem in the damage that we do to either our cardiovascular system, our digestive system, our reproductive system and our immune system, among other um, systems like the endocrine system and other systems, which um, I, I would need a whole day to go into. <laughs> but just to kind of give you the overview. Um, the reason this is such a, an important topic right now um, the stats from when I first wrote, wrote my first book to now have just gone through the, the roof. So they, the most recent studies, so this is from a Deloitte study, and um, the most recent studies indicate that around 76% of us have experienced burnout at some stage in our career. Um, and as I said, when I had my own burnout experience, the doctors weren't diagnosing burnout. It's only since 2011 become um, a, a medical diagnosis that the the who have now recognised and given a definition of, and and doctors are now um, you know when they're 
sitting with somebody and and hearing about the different signs and symptoms that they have going on suggesting okay it sounds like you you've burned out um what happened in in my experience and and this was very much how i experienced burnout there's it's a bit like going to pick a mix shop as a kid and all and the various assortment of different things that you could possibly choose um if you went with a friend you know what you would have in your pick and mix bag and what they would have in theirs will be very different to each other so my own personal burnout experience won't really be comparable necessarily to anyone else's there might be similarities um but it, it was unique to me as every burnout experience is unique to the individual but whenever I, I burned out there was lots going on for me um that I was overriding so things like episodes of um real uh fatigue where I couldn't switch off and I couldn't get off to sleep um oh there's some sounds like a cartoon in the background (laughs) yeah sorry Jess I've just muted you we're getting some background noise um uh yeah so some some um sorry lost my thread what I was experiencing at the time yeah waking up in the morning and not really feeling refreshed from from sleep it would almost feel like sometimes that I was working all night my mind wouldn't really um stop so I was tired but I was still wired and kind of restless with within myself um and I would um the the, the sort of the lifestyle issues that I said people when they're unable to switch off and then in the morning not feeling refreshed will quite often reach for things that pep them up so we've developed a culture at the moment where we are bombarded all the time with media messaging around energy drinks you know everything's caffeinated this that and the other there's a reason for that that these caffeinated drinks that in the market for them is is um so huge because People need these things at the moment or they think they need them to to keep them going. Um, But all it does is really feels more of the the problem. Um, So people are having caffeine to get themselves going in the morning. That caffeine's in their system all day. It's not really been um, discharged by the end of the day. And then they're drinking quite often wine, beer, you know, any other alcohol to help them suppress that tired but wired feeling and help them go off to sleep it's another you know a huge alcohol abuse problem in this country and we've normalized our dependency on alcohol um I mean if you think about the lockdowns the only stores that seem to stay open were the alcohol shops it's like you could go buy alcohol but you couldn't go get Christmas presents and wells for your children it's like there's something wrong there um and so there's there's um signs and things that people will because of cultural norms have normalized that they don't even realize are there and then there will be things like for myself where there were larger things but I hadn't really associated it with doing too much I would just put it down to coincidence oh I got this illness oh you know people just get sick you know not really realizing that it was um, stress underneath the surface that was creating the ill illness the the, the sense of dis-ease in my body um, until it all kind of caught up with me. I'd all been going on for too long um, and my immune system was so low, I ended up um, catching literally just some kind of cold flu type illness around Christmas time, going home and then it just floored me completely. It was like there wasn't anything else in my tank to give and I was uh, and I couldn't get back out of bed. My body just shut down to preserve myself (laughs) Uh, and it wouldn't release the energy back to me um, it seemed until I had actually uh, made peace with not doing anything and and with making and having rest and then piecing back together okay what are the behaviors going on under the surface and what do I need to change and then my energy returned so at the moment most like that's like an overwhelming majority of people will have experienced some form of burnout at some stage they might just not appreciate that that's what it was at the time when it happened um at, as it stands right now um the studies show that 50 percent of all workers and this is across the, the world you know all of the western um economies uk the usa and europe are on the brink of burnout and that stats even higher with C-suite executives. Um, so it's really um, important that we that we speak to burnout. Um, it's really important that we understand it, and it's really important that we all um, look after ourselves as coaches 
um, so that we don't burn out, but also know how to help hold a space for self-reflection, for taking stock and for changing things for, for our clients. So many coaches will be arriving at your sessions, often carrying the burden of burnout. And um, sometimes it can be that it's just quickly, it's just very um, slowly, sorry, crept up on somebody. Um, and they've got so used to functioning in a certain way that they don't appreciate how close they are to burnout. And, and quite often it can be like the straw that broke the camel's back, that something happens, a big life event a big change in circumstances or something that shifts them into extreme anxiety that wasn't part of their lives before and and suddenly everything changes so something like the pandemic for example played that part for many people suddenly find themselves in extreme uncertainty and fear that was enough for many people just to tip over the edge um it becomes really evident in organizations when there's high levels of presenteeism absenteeism and leaveism um, and you can often spot that there's a burnout issue in an organization when these things are happening it's got the biggest impact on unplanned absences and um, employee turnover and quite often when somebody um, is off work it's uh, it's a big deal um, for them to be off work one of the biggest things I find in the background for clients is is the inability to take a day's rest when they really need one. Um, unless the head's literally hanging off, they will force themselves to go to work. So the fact that these absences are happening is quite often as well. You know, our cultural conditioning is you, you have a cold, you go to work. You're not feeling great, you go to work, you, you don't, you, you drag yourself there. So that's, yeah, it's sort of a sign of the times really that people are so exhausted that they have they just literally can't get themselves out of bed to get there in, in most cases when they are off ill um more forward thinking organizations are doing things like bringing in duvet days and acknowledging that sometimes we do just need to stay in bed and not go to work there was a day where I forced myself to go to work when I kind of look back with the benefit of hindsight and I ended up having a car accident that day and I really shouldn't have gone to work I just needed a day to reset myself and recharge and trying to go to work wasn't doing anyone any favors but I didn't feel I had the support of the employer at the time and, and my own internal conditioned beliefs um, were at odds with the idea of, of having a day of rest so so um, before I move into how to spot it does anybody have any questions I feel like I am talking 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 so just to give you an opportunity um, we will be going to breakout room in about sort of five, 10 minutes. If there's anything, anyone's sitting on the hands, bursting to ask. Okay, so how do we spot it? It shows up in several different ways and I will speak a little bit to each of these. So it can affect us cognitively, behaviorally, emotionally, physically, environmentally, energetically, and also intuitively. So I'll explain what I mean by each of these different categories. So typically when somebody's experiencing burnout and the way it's affecting them, and quite often it won't be that we're necessarily just only experiencing it in one of these areas, there will likely be an overlap of more than one area where we're um, recognizing that things have changed in our usual healthier way of functioning so um, those of us that are usually the person that's able to come up with solutions to problems that can usually remember facts and figures and regurgitate them that's maybe thought of as um, either that, that they think themselves you know, they're quite creative they might even work in a creative industry or they access creativity creativity as part of of what they do um, Typically what will happen when we're going through or on the brink of burnout is we won't be able to access that way of cognitively functioning as quickly, as easily, as effortlessly. We can start to feel like quite foggy um, and have what's described as memory lags, for example, where we just um, can't get the, the, the information that we would normally just be able to bring to mind. So that's how it can quite often show up. And these aren't exhaustive lists. I've just tried to gather the most common um, common things and to give you a sort of snapshot. Behaviorally, um, 
somebody who usually would be able to sit and work with something and be quite focused and not have an issue with needing to um kind of get up and move about and I don't when I say it, it's not necessarily an issue um because some of us will be naturally quite restless in our wiring so um some of us need to have movement throughout the day in order to access all of our creativity and that's a healthy part of our functioning but when behaviorally we aren't normally that way and when maybe our our problem is being too sedentary and suddenly we find we just can't sit in a meeting we just have to get out it's like uh, there's something in our body that's saying move just get me out of here then that restlessness can be a sign that there's something going on and it's expressing itself in a behavioral sense um clumsiness when usually you're not a clumsy person um unfinished projects when usually you would work on one thing move to another so some people work with lots of projects on the go and that's their way of of operating so it's not that it's more like when you 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 just can't bring yourself to focus to do the thing and you get too distracted but not because of the way you you're you're wired but because there's just too much on your plate and you have been having this stress system response firing and it's showing up in this way finding yourself going round and round in circles flitting from a to b um finding you're just constantly overbooked there's maybe hardly any space in your in your calendar and when there is you can't protect it you might have said to yourself you're going to have time out but then you give in and and book something else in you find it hard to say no you end up cancelling things at the last minute because you've overscheduled quite often and this will show up for clients in not just their work but also in their social life so the way they do one thing is often the way they'll do everything so they'll be overbooking their weekends their evenings and then coming to an event that they actually really deeply want to go to but they're just too tired and they just can't it's just one thing too many in a day or at the weekend they just need to rest so um cancelling on friends when that's not normally their style um and finding they get drawn into kind of chaos scenarios that feel um like there's a stirring up of drama and chaos which isn't again something that they usually find themselves in um, so that's how it can show up behaviorally. And then emotionally, it's the the sort of feeling sometimes people will describe it as being like as if they're underwater. Um, I had a client that I worked on last week, uh, worked with last week um, for a retreat. And it was this sense of um, not being able to kind of come up for more than just a breath of air and then back under the water again. And in that place of overwhelm, um those of us that that don't necessarily cry easily usually can feel very tearful um some people will experience um the, the kind of pressure if things have built up around them they've maybe gone from an um having the responsibility of one job to having three jobs on their shoulders it sounds like they're being deeply pressed and that can show up as depression um it's not always um associated and not all of these things are always indicative of burnout, but it but it can also be part of the, the bigger picture um, for some. The inability to relax, a kind of uh, ongoing sense of, of worry and anxiety that hap is happening more and more about more and more things and carrying that through the day and through the night um, effects and impacts on our libido. Um, we can become cynical again, not, not everybody and not always, um, it's in the who definition, it quite, fo quite significantly focuses on a cynicism, especially in relation to work. And yet actually in a, in the majority of the clients I've worked with over the years, they actually are still very positive about of often the workplace and are not cynical and are not resentful necessarily sometimes where there's been a real abuse of the um, level of workloads and too much has been put on someone and they've not been um, they've been overlooked for things or underappreciated and undervalued then that can appear but it can be that somebody still retains quite a positive upbeat at attitude and yet they're also feeling overwhelmed they're also feeling teary they're also feeling um, exhausted so all of these things aren't don't always necessarily happen to everybody. So I just want to re-emphasize that. Um, and lack of fulfillment can often be part of that picture. 
And then physically feeling that fatigue, but still feeling like the adrenaline is going, the tired but wired scenario, insomnia, picking up colds easily um, and not being able to get rid of them again, um, headaches, dizzy episodes, IBS can be really common, so indigestion problems, backache. Now, obviously, quite often when people are working much longer hours than they than is healthy for for them, then backache can be linked to the sort of sedentary type of sitting at a desk and being uh, arched over with the shoulders and you know. But it's also really common that it, somebody could be burning out and they don't have a desk bound job and they don't have a job that necessarily would be contributing. Um, to backache and yet they will still have a feeling of um, lower back ache very commonly um, and it's as if the body can give us these symptoms as a metaphor of what of the lack of support quite often when it's sort of lower back ache there seems to be a, a common link there I found and then panic attacks can occur for people who've never had panic attacks before and then all of a sudden they find themselves um, just unable to cope in certain scenarios uh, as if this overwhelming anxiety overcomes them and and um and they're experiencing something that they is very unfamiliar to them and it can be quite frightening also heart palpitations with very unexplained um when the when uh, tests are run the, the doctors are unable to say that the, the reason for them and again it's underneath it is 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 the stress and it's the body trying to let us know that we need to slow down and we need to rebalance and, and do things differently and change something this is less commonly talked about so all of the things I've said up until now you might be quite familiar with but actually in our physical environments um there are signs and symptoms of of burnout too so somebody who previously loved plants knows how to care for plants Look, you know, has a, got a green thumb, green finger, depending what part of the world you're in, um, will also often find that, you know, around them, their plants have, have just, as they've forgotten to water themselves, they've forgotten to water their plants and the plants have died. There will be an accumulation of clutter, even for people that normally would be quite well organized and keep everything in its place. It's like everything starts to blur, the boundaries blur, everything goes, clutter starts to, to accumulate. And along with that, unfinished tasks, things breaking down because they're not looked after, car problems, typically because they've forgotten to do the servicing, um, you know, boiler problems, things going on in the, the house that they're normally on top of. And, and, and then again, it just starts to accumulate and show up in all of the different areas of, of their life. Energetically, quite often people will describe their, the feeling of themselves as being a bit like a zombie feeling a bit ghost-like, as if they're not in their body, it's as if they um, are kind of only partially present. And there's a saying, you know, the lights are on and nobody's home. It's almost, it's, that's used in a different context usually, but it's almost like that. It's like they're there in front of you, but you feel like they're somewhere else and they themselves don't feel like themselves. They'll quite often just say that, I just don't feel like myself. Um, and they all often experience being drained by other people's stuff. So when I burned out, for example, I became really aware of how certain people, places and things actually really drained me. In the run up to burnout, I hadn't been taking that information in. I hadn't been registering that. But once I'd burned out, I could really not be around some people because I just couldn't have coped with the amount of energy they would have taken from me. So um, noticing what your clients might say about other people and how they feel around them and the depletion that they feel around certain people, um, it will start to become more focused. Um, intuitively, when we're burning out, it's much harder for us to get to our gut feelings and access the solutions that we have. So many of you, I'm sure, will be familiar with Nancy Klein's work. Um, if you're working as a coach, um, she's obviously one of the kind of fairy godmothers of coaching almost and the concept of the the client has the solutions um, the client sometimes just won't be able to get to their solutions for themselves because they they've disconnected so much from their sense of themselves that they they can't get in there so you might notice them saying that they just they don't know what they're in a inner kind of sat nav is saying 
They're finding it very difficult to make decisions where before they might have even had responsibility for making huge decisions um, on any given day. They might have been quick fire making decisions. And then it's almost like they just reached this point of inability to make any decision. They can't decide what they want for dinner, let alone whether or not they should make you know, 200 employees redundant or whether they should or shouldn't accept the acquisition that's on the table in front of them. And it, and it's as if this internal sat nav has just gone wonky. Um, and with that, there can be this loss of a sense of self and, and purpose. Um, so as I say, this can all come about gradually, a bit like kind of quicksand creeping up on us. Or it can be quite sudden um, and because of something going on um, in or around us, it can be something that just happens like the straw that broke the camel's back. So any of these things, post viral illness, traumatic incidents, somebody passing, divorce, moving home, having a new baby, an ongoing ongoing period of uncertainty, taking on more jobs than you can really that you have the capacity for. Those sorts of things can then lead to that being like the straw that broke the camel's back. So, Jane, I just do a breakout. Yes. Just going to come in with two questions from the chat. Uh, seems yeah, like a relevant point. Um, one is from Aldous asking, what's the relationship between burnout and depression? So, there, there, as I say, there, there is a relationship with all of these things and burnout, but not always so quite often when it comes in and it and it's um showing up and then the the manifestation of burnout is is in in depression the experience is quite often this sort of feeling of being deeply pressed so they're being people will, will often talk with their bodies and their experience of where they feel any given symptom um and the depression one is quite often like they are being pressed on so quite often they'll talk about it carrying the weight of the world they'll bring metaphors into the room and the more you can work with the metaphors as a coach the more you'll be able to uncover what's what's underneath that so they might start talking about like the weight of the world feeling under pressure feeling like they're being pressed and how that then means that they're unable to um access the energy the enthusiasm the the ideas the creativity all these other things that they um previously would have done um and again that can kind of creep up or it can be something that just one day just happens it feels like it's just come out of the blue and they're suddenly in this kind of fog um and depression anxiety there's gradients to all of these things but um, one of the things I want to to move into uh, as we move through this workshop is how to know when to signpost and how to know when somebody really um, would benefit from you uh, sharing with them that it could be helpful for them to get um, additional support. Um, and that's one of those areas. So when you notice that there's, um, sorry, I'm just trying to get all of you guys on my screen so this uh, so I can see your faces those of you who are on camera um when something feels like within a coaching conversation you wouldn't be able to stay with a coaching conversation and um the person wouldn't be able to access what they need for the coaching to be beneficial then that's when you know that that actually they they need something beyond your capabilities and your competencies as a coach so there's varying degrees of, of depression. There's varying degrees of, of anxiety and how that might show up in a coaching conversation and um, ascertaining whether the person ha is already getting help and whether or not they feel that something else like counselling or psychotherapy might be beneficial and helpful to them, whether they've been to see their GP. It's always really good to ask. And if somebody's relaying something to you around a symptom and have you sought any other have you sought any medical advice about this? Have you been to see anyone else? Going back to the contracting that you would have in place with that individual when you began your coaching work together, saying, okay, so this is something that's come in that wasn't there at the beginning. So I want to check in with you around, around that. And as a duty of care to you, I want to make sure you're getting the right support. And um, because obviously the contract we have together is a coaching relationship and it's about us moving forward. And, um, you know, so 
I hope that answers your question. Is there anything more on that that you would like to know? And just while we wait on that response, um, Sue says, is the difference here between, is the difference between what is usual for that person and what is happening currently for them key here? Yes, it is. It is. Mm -hmm. Because when you begin a relationship with somebody um, and you're entering into a coaching arrangement, somebody may have something that's been ongoing. And as long as they're able to have conversations with you in a coaching way, um, and they're still and they've got support, they've got awareness of they live, they've lived with something, they understand it themselves, they'll, you know, that the, the client knows themselves better than anyone else could ever know them. So always being open and transparent and encouraging that with your client and um, contracting for them to let you know if anything changes from the outset as you move through coaching together can really mean that you can op easily refer back to that and say, okay, where we're at right now, how you were when you first came to it, I'm seeing a difference here and I'm I'm wondering what you might feel you need for that, you know, and, and whether you've considered that and are you creating space for that in your life? So it's not that we can't talk about these things. It's just about ensuring that they are also giving full consideration to that appropriately so that you can still continue to coach them effectively. If anything becomes bigger than the coaching space and gets in the way of the coaching process, that's when you know then that it needs to go somewhere else, that some some extra support is needed. It doesn't mean that you necessarily can't coach them alongside this other support that they have, but it might mean in some instances that they do need to pause from working with you because something's come up for them unexpectedly, something could surface that they actually really need to go and work through before they can come back and have a, a healthy coaching conversation with you um, and stay in that way of working brilliant thank you okay so um we want to give you the opportunity to pop into a breakout room and see what uh, is sitting with you at the moment from what we've shared so far so um we've set up breakout rooms of three four in a group together so that you're in quite a small nice cozy kind of space to, to really see what, you know, shared experiences, what's sitting with you, and then it would be really helpful for us because I want to shape this to be as helpful for you as possible when we come back, the kind of top lines of the themes you can then share in, in chat, and then that will help me direct what we do um, for the remainder of the, the session. So um, if we open up the breakout rooms, is that okay, Alex? Yeah, here um, we go. Okay, and fabulous question as part of the final um section so um so so thank you to those of you who just shared coming out of the rooms and um obviously we didn't record that section for for confidentiality and um, but there's a few things that i want to now sort of follow up on that will hopefully um give some extra takeaways from this session for those of you listening to the recording and also those of you that are still in the in the, in the room live um so one is on this concept of your role as a coach and how you can also help at the preventative stage of things. Um, it can be difficult when somebody doesn't have the self-awareness that they're burning out um, and doesn't have any pre-existing experience of burnout for them to be coachable. So sometimes the, the burnout signs and symptoms get in the way of that individual being able to access their own internal knowing and their, find their own internal solutions, in which case they will start looking to you more for advice. And that's where really, again, you want to signpost then to me medical professionals predominantly who can give them the advice they're actually seeking because you can't coach them when they're in that space. But there will also be those that have had pre-existing experience of burnout can can see the flags and the signs and in coming and having sessions with you you're creating that safe space for them to explore their thinking to recognize those signs and symptoms and to hold them accountable to recognizing them and working out what do they want to do with that so how are they going to do things in a different way what does it mean to them to have these things happening and and what are they going to do about that and there's an um what's called a belief equation um, based on the theory of how we we form beliefs so this is both um positive beliefs and then also negative beliefs of our of ourselves so when we are in a position where we are with somebody who's in who's an authority figure 
And you might remember sort of when you were younger and you form kind of core beliefs that it, there would be a parental figure or somebody, um, perhaps a religious figure, a cultural figure, somebody um, that was maybe a school teacher and um, that was a significant, had a significant role in your life. And at a particular moment where you were in a space of heightened emotion and suggestibility, those two things together, the authority figure, heightened emotion and suggestibility, equaled the formation of a belief. When you, um, you, so I use this model to help people to acknowledge when beliefs were formed and quite often it's the ones that are then hindering us. So they might've been helpful at one stage, keeping us safe when we were young, but then they can start to get in our way. And, and when we're adults and we come to having coaching relationships, we recognize, oh yeah, that thing about always doing my best. Yes, it was great when I needed to get that grade or I needed to move out of that class or I needed, but now I'm trying to apply doing my best, doing my best to absolutely everything. And there's no goalposts in sight. So I just go uh, overload with it. Right. So something like that, we'd be looking at these beliefs and how do we change them? This can happen based on one moment, the formation of a belief, or it can happen by osmosis. So the rep repetition of lots of things accumulating together. When you are a coach and you're in a room with somebody, you aren't an authority figure because you are holding an equal stance to that person. It's an adult to adult equal relationship. You're coming alongside them. You're coming in a space as um, a partner. You're a thinking partner. You're um, co-creating the relationship with your client. So you are seeing the brilliance I think of it like a, a diamond, the brilliance in your client and you're owning your brilliance in yourself. You're being authentic. You're acknowledging that you are human, there's flaws and all, you know, and you're holding unconditional positive regard for your client. And you can only really meet your client to the level that you've met yourself. But when you hold your client in their brilliance and you're holding like a mirror to that brilliance for your client, and you're surfacing not just beliefs that need to change, but you're surfacing qualities about that person. You're surfacing attributes that they have that they maybe neglect to see for themselves and you're reminding them of them. You have a, a power in the relationship. The client grants you that power, but there's power in the relationship nonetheless, and there's power for, for transformational change. So when a client is with you and you're seeing the brilliance of them, and they are in a high emotional state and they're suggestible, which they will be when they're honoring the space and time they have with you. They're valuing their coaching with you. They're coming feeling safe to go to all of the emotional places that they maybe can't go to in other areas of their life and are maybe going to for the first time ever in their life because of the safe space that you create. Then there can be new beliefs formed that are positive, that are transformational, that can change the trajectory that that client would otherwise be taking towards burnout. And so there is this real power and that's what, this is why I'm so passionate about coaching and the, and, and the role it can have in the prevention of burnout is that you can help people to form new beliefs about themselves that prevent them from burning out, that enable them to see their own brilliance, their worth, and to believe that they're worth caring about. Because ultimately in most organizations, people are not being cared for, they're not being cared about, they're a disposable um, element of the organization and can be replaced. And fortunately, some organizations aren't approaching things that way, but, but too many people are just being used and abused and organizations trying to get as much out of that person as they possibly can do. They've got away with, you know, shrinking three jobs into one. And if that person's kept going and kept holding all together and kept performing, then there's been no reason for the organization to do anything about it and change it. So coaching can be very empowering in helping people to take back their own self-worth, believe that they are enough as themselves and for, for the things that got in the way of them looking after themselves, listening to their intuition, noticing the signs and symptoms, acting on those things, feeling connected to their sat nav again and recognizing it and registering when their bodies are giving them information rather than overriding it with caffeine and 
suppressing things with alcohol and whatever else we use as band-aids for our kind of pain or distress you, you're making a, a really big difference so there was a question about um what tools and what can you use to support the person in front of you to make this sort of change and had we had a little bit longer I would have set you out in another breakout room to explore what you already have on board because in your coach training, no matter where you've trained and how you've come to be here in the room as part of this Mo call, you will have been given the key foundationary pieces that are coaching. You will have been taught how to listen, how to let go of your own thinking and your own um, need to solution find or, um, or you know, your tendency to give advice or any of that. You'll have been taught how to put all of that stuff down and to be really present with the person in front of you. And if you can be really present with the person in front of you and help them to take stock on the reality of the situation that they're in and be really honest with themselves and ask questions and, and notice the response you get back. And are they telling themselves the truth? Are they just saying what they think you need to hear? Call them on it if they are. You're saying this thing, and your mouth might even be smiling when you say it, but I, for some reason, don't believe you. <laughs> What's really going on? What's the, the true reality here? What are you telling yourself internally? What's the story that you're telling yourself? Where does that come from? Surfacing what's getting in the way. What are the options? How can that person move forward? What things could they be doing differently? If they had a magic wand, you know, what, what support would they call in? What resources might they need? How might things look different? What is it that they don't want? Quite often people can find it hard to come up with what they do want. But if you ask them what they don't want anymore, what they've had enough of, what they're sick of, what they're tired of, it will all come tumbling out. So once you've got out all of the things they don't want, then they can start to connect with actually, what, what would I want instead? If that whole pile of everything I've dumped out was no longer there, how would I feel? And what would I want instead? How would I take small steps towards bringing that in? What would I do about it? So I would invite you moving out of this session to take some time, ideally today and journal maybe before you go to bed, like what do you already know? What tools are you already using? Um, what ones maybe have you forgotten about that you could go back to your training manuals, dust them off, have a kind of recap and where you're getting stuck? Um, I do just want to kind of remind you of how important supervision is. It's not mandated in our profession, but it's such a valuable resource for us to take these dilemmas that we get when we're working as coaches. Something we can just feel really alone in coaching and forget that there's other people that have got our back that can support us, that can help us with our own blind spots, just the way we help our clients and look after yourself, your own self-care. Supervision can also be really restorative for us. So what are you doing to resource yourself as a coach, as a professional, but also just on a human level? Like, are you getting enough sleep? What are you doing so that you're um, replenishing yourself? Are you getting outdoors? Are you moving? Um, those of you that are neurodiverse and recognize that already about yourselves, are you listening to when your body needs to move, when you need to um, be outside, when you need to play with something, when you need to stand up, sit down, you know, what, what do you need? Um, how can you be more open and honest about your needs, either in your workplace or with the individuals that you work with, depending on your setup in the way that you work? Um, so thank you all for coming tonight. I've really enjoyed speaking with all of you. I hope it's been really helpful. Feel free to get in touch if there's anything that I've kind of left you hanging and you've got questions around. You'll find me quite easily on LinkedIn. Um, there is a um, podcast that my husband and I, my, I found my way to Mo because of my husband having trained with Mo. Um, there's a podcast we have together that um, there are two episodes specifically on mental health um, and I'm just screen sharing. Hopefully you can see that. Can you see that? Um, yeah, cover? yeah. Yeah. Um, it's called The Art of Balance and you'll find it on all of the sort of major podcast um, platforms. Uh, it could be a helpful resource for you. Um, and as I said at the beginning, I'm affiliated with the ICF and the AC. I know the ICF 
um, have a considerable amount of resources that are freely available on their website, as I'm sure the AC do as well. If you take a look at some of the things, if you've got affiliations with governing, not governing bodies, but professional bodies, you'll likely find there's there's lots there. Sometimes you just need to remember that it's it's there um, and access it. So thank you, all of you. And thank you for having me, Alex. Awesome. Welcome. Um, would everyone who'd like to be involved in the screenshot just uh, come off camera oh, yes. and uh, <laughs> give whatever gesture or non-gesture you'd like? Uh, I'm going to go with peace sign. <laughs> I'm going to hold up my little mushroom. <laughs> Awesome. Thank you, everyone. Um, yeah, thanks so much, Jane. Thanks, thanks so much for coming. I'm sure you'll be hearing from uh, some of us in the Mo community, and it'd be great to stay connected. Uh, the recordings will go out on the Facebook page and elsewhere in the next week or two. And if anyone's got any questions or would like to get in touch with Jane through me, uh, they can do so. Uh, unless anyone else has got anything burning, um, thank you all so much for coming and see you sometime soon. Lovely. Thank you, everybody. Go well. Cheers. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye-bye.